but in particular, um, I think it's so amazing how um, those of you with this expertise continue to invest in developing and advancing the knowledge in our industry around um, technologies that are safer, that are more efficient and sustainable, um, while at the same time looking to optimize performance properties for the products that we, that we produce as an industry. And this year's recipient of the Only Medal um, is being recognized for his work in durable fre uh, press finishing of cotton. Um, and if you haven't read it already, there's really a wonderful article in the most recent um, edition of the AATCC magazine where you can um, learn more about um, Ken's work and, and his background. Um, and of course, we're gonna learn more about um, his work this morning. Um, I also want to recognize Ken as a really generous volunteer with the association and a wonderful mentor to, to so many. Ken Greeson holds a BS in textile chemistry with a concentration in polymer chemistry from North Carolina State University, go pack. He has tremendous industry experience and long tenure at Cotton Incorporated um, as manager of textile chemistry and research. Please welcome Ken. Thank you, Carrie. I'll try to live up to that introduction. So I'm honored to be here. Um, when I heard about this uh, fine honor, I was just uh, tickle pink. I was like, what's the punchline? Because I, I, I didn't believe it at first. So um, I have everybody that I've interacted with here, and I, I recognize probably 90% of you uh, for having helped me at some point and maybe in turn I've helped some of you. And just like Carrie talked about, we have interacted quite a bit with her business relationship and now her uh, being president of ATCC, I'll offer anything she needs to help do the job with ATCC. I think it's a wonderful association. I'm glad to be here talking about a little about what I've done through my career. So, uh, unlike Elizabeth yesterday, I don't know if I'm going to be the ultimate uh, motivational speaker, but I'll try to keep it alive. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little about serendipity. And what I mean here is, just like all of us, coming out of college, I had some grandiose scheme about what I was doing. I was, had a polymer chemistry concentration. There were no jobs in polymer chemistry. I'm like, what am I going to do? So I took the, for the last job I could get, which was dyeing and finishing. I was like, well, I'll do that dirty dyeing and finishing stuff for a couple of years. I took a few classes of this, he stayed in it, and then uh, I'll try to get into polymers. Well, I really never did get into fiber forming polymers. I, I worked with some later in my career as solution polymers, but I never went back to that. I had too much fun doing the dyeing and finishing stuff. But at that time, as I mentioned, I was kind of thrust into some stuff. But uh, Lady Luck, Serendipity, whatever, threw me into a couple things. And I've done more than these over my career, but I thought it's interesting. We all talk of sustainability, but I, we were doing sustainable stuff then. It's cycled around. Back in the late 70s when I was in college, they had the gas crisis. I remember long lines. The energy was short. People were trying to save energy. So I worked with foam finishing. And then a few years after that, uh, we got into eliminating uh, or reducing formaldehyde. And I'll talk some about that. And then it all came back together later in my career. So uh, it's funny how, as I mentioned, it's all cyclic. And then, uh, so I was shoved into these things, but then I like them. <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> where, where is it at? Where, what happened to my body? <laughs> so, there I am. And this is uh, what I like, uh, looked like when my future wife at the time, Anne Marie, and I met. And uh, that was one of the fortunate things uh, that I went to work in Charlotte and she lived there and we hit it off. So, 1981, here I come charging into the industry. And uh, my job there where I worked was low web pickup research. 
We did foam, we did other things. And it wasn't just foam finishing, which I've done more recently, it's foam dyeing. We made lots of messes with acid dyes. When they hit the floor, you can't get them up. But we did some, and we also worked with foam finishes. So we were doing the, the nylon carpet with the acid dyeing. But then we were doing some wet on wet work, and that's actually what I did throughout that job. Uh, my first job was, I uh, actually ended up going to a mill in eastern North Carolina and run some trials there. And uh, we did our homework in the lab, doing some wet and wet stuff. We had some nice equipment there, but then we went to the factory. And I'll tell you that about that in a minute. We also were looking at fluorocarbons, foaming them on upholstery fabrics to make the pile repellent without saturating a big, thick piece of upholstery and having to dry it and cure it. So all that stuff you hear about now, we were doing it back then. So, one of my co-graduates was working for a summer research project and he and I said well, we've got a really nice latex foamer, it pumps foam out, but we have no way to put this on fabric. So we went out to the local, um, I think it was Heckinger at the time, went to the hardware store, grabbed a big piece of plywood, went back in the shop at work, they had a circular saw, we took some nails, put it all together bought a little piece, piece of plexiglass to go under it. There are side supports, as mentioned on this, that were not, not, not shown, but we could adjust it up and down. I actually had a little piece of plexiglass on the back to help scrape foam down. And we did some nice stuff with this little home-built applicator. And of course, being good NC State graduates, we painted it red. <laughs> so we, we were doing this work with the Napanade and softener, so uh, a few months after I came there, we went to this plant, big warp knit operation. And they were doing beam dye and warp knits, acetate, sardels, and uh, we were trying to put an apinate on wet on wet. So first round, the factory had gotten everything ready on their own. So they made a home built foam applicator. It was almost like that contraption I showed you, but it was bigger, it was plywood. It had neoprene flaps on the front and the back to keep the foam in. We ran the fabric through it, it picked up foam somehow, and then went in a tinner. But right before that, we had a big vacuum extractor that they built on their own. They had hand carved slots in this metal pipe, put this big industrial vacuum on the end of it. So we started the foam first, we, we were using the pad to help control things, it was squeezing out some water, but we we're going in wet and wet. We had a huge foam bank come out first, it got all over the equipment, and then as we ran, we finally got under control. We were foaming, proud of ourselves. Uh, pulling that fabric out to width, going down the tenor frame. So we said, now it's time to cut on the vacuum. The whole building shook. <laughs> It sucked the fabric down in the vacuum slot. The thing went from 70 yards a minute down to two. The poor operator started pulling it tighter. It got back up to speed. Everything's shaking on the tenor frame. Finally, oh, I forgot to tell you, there were, every senior VP in the company was there watching the trial. <laughs> so me and my associate were standing aside watching this and we were running the foamer, but it just became more and more surreal. Something finally gave with all this tension, and there was a lot of polyester in that fabric. Uh, so, you might guess. We were going down through an idle roll in the bottom of the pad trough. It went up, and these fabrics are 140, 160 inch wide. That roll is that big around, probably weighed three or 400 pounds. I've never seen so many VPs scurry so quickly. So enough of the little side story, but I figured I'd give you a little entertainment. And, but my, my compadre and I were laughing so hard we couldn't stand up. And then, but then they told us some things in unprintable words like take your tails back to corporate and never come back again. <laughs> so we did, but then they rethought it. And as mentioned here, we went, we, they got a big Gaston County FFT. It's the old V design, but it was wrapped around a barrel. And then we started running trials on that. Everything would go well. Actually, I was transferred to plant temporarily to run that. And, but uh, over a long run, we, we would apply, go to the napper, and you can't see what the phone's doing, so it could be breaking down the applicator. We thought it had good pressures according to the gauges, but 
we got to the napper and then part way through the run it would start showing a bubbly appearance on the fabric and we figured the foam had broken down near the run somewhere so they'd have to go back and rework the goods, repat them, re -nap them. They didn't like me for that so but every time I came back to the supervisor, I want to run another trial. He's like, well, we got too much production to run. Well, I moved on. <laughs> so, but I'm going to make a little jump ahead. That was 90, uh, 81, 82. 2002, I come to Cotton Incorporated after other career moves. There's a brand new gas and CFS staring me in the face. And uh, some of the people there had worked with it, but uh, I'd gone to FFT school at Gaston back in the early 80s. And I was one of the few people who actually knew how to calculate what to put on and where to push the buttons and everything. So we started running trials. We had one on the pilot tenor frame and we did several uh, interesting trials. I'll go through some of the results here. It was, but uh, as opposed to FFT design, which is what I was working with in the early 80s, the CFS, instead of being a V, is a parabola. The foam's pumped in the center, and the way it's designed, every part where the foam comes in deflects off and comes out, and it gives uniform pressure across the applicator width. So much more control over your application. So uh, it was an improvement. But again, in Cotton Incorporated, we had a lab unit, it was 42 inches wide. We were tying up some time on our pilot tender and we ended up getting a smaller unit with multiple heads on it. I'll go back to that in a minute. And there's a smaller unit. And it has like six heads that you can use top, bottom, top, bottom. Um, here we were just putting a little bit of uh, tint in the foam to show where the finish was going on. Because when it's running right, you can't see foam, you only see the finish suddenly appearing on the fabric. A little interlude here. I need to mention tough cotton technology for abrasion resistance. And Dr. John Turner, my predecessor at cotton, retired the day before I came and he went from parking in the regular parking spots to parking in the visitor spots and started consulting for us. So John and I talked a lot about this abrasion finish. We did a lot of good work and we ran some foam trials shortly after came there with this technology. Uh, basically, and, and if you look up the AATC article, it goes through some of the uh, things about this technology. It wasn't called tough, top, tough cotton at the time. It was called improving the performance of non-durable press cotton garments, which our market to people hated. So we, we renamed it later. So we ran a trial, um, I'm calling it trial A, it was just trial XYZ. And we, we put on heavyweight cotton denim fabrics. Our tenor was short, so we had to dry and then cure, but on a longer machine, we envisioned that with foam, we'd get half the wet pickup of padding. So we could dry it very quickly and then cure in the rest of the machine so you wouldn't have to two pass it like we were telling some denim mills to do. They didn't like that at all. It was killing their production. So, um, the finish works at 50 laundry cycles. It's there for the life of the garment when it's probably applied. So we did that, and then we did another one on cotton twill fabrics. With, we put tough cotton on the face to concentrate there where we wanted to see less abrasion loss. But we put a post-cure resin on the back, and when we cured the resin, it gives a permanent crease. But the, the post-cure finish will degrade the cotton so by putting it on the back we see less degradation when you wash the pant legs and look at the creases and the tough cotton will give us extra protection. It actually worked. We came up with some good looking uh, pants out of this trial. So we've done some other trials. I'm going to just breeze through this and I have uh, Jimmy Rowe over here who worked with me on several of these. And Jimmy's moved from the technical to the consumer marketing area. You'll hear his talk later, but I'm proud to work with Jimmy on a lot of this stuff. And we did some uh, like moisture management finishes, but on one side just scraping a little bit of a uh, repellent on, and then when you sweat, it would pop through that and make your skin feel drier. We've done that with other techniques, but. Um, we've also done moist curing finishes for durable press on cotton shirting. And I actually went overseas and ran a trial with this. 
foam application flame retardant finishes. We did cotton fabrics, we also did some non-wovens with a student from NC State to use as a barrier fabric on mattresses. And then uh, my colleague Lynn Ferries and I did a lot of these trials together. I have to give Lynn a lot of credit for working with me on planning. If it involved dying, he usually took the lead. If it was finished, I took the lead. But we needed a couple people on the foam unit to make sure things went right. So the foam dry, dying trials, let me go back to that. Foam dyeing has taken off lately, really as opposed to foam finishing. Uh, my predecessor for the only metal, uh, Mr. Howard Malpas, and I worked together in one of my early jobs, and I'm about to get into that, but Howard moved from there into Indigo Dyeing, and some of the Indigo Zero he's worked on uh, involves using a foam applicator, but as opposed to using one foam head or two foam heads and putting it on real heavily, do you ever paint your house by putting on one big coat? No, you put on successive coats if you want it evenly. By splitting it up to different foam heads, we were able to apply it more carefully and build up the color and it looked much more uniform. The fixation was wonderful. Almost no wash off after, after you steamed it, you go to washing compared to conventional pad uh, dyeing. So we've seen a lot of potential. And now the dye part of the technology is taken off in the industry. So I'm gonna jump into durable press finish. I mentioned there's a, a, like a two-folded sustainability story, foam and formaldehyde. So, 1982, I left that position working with the, the crazy foam trials we ran in the early 80s and moved on to another company. A little piece dye plant. And we were running a lot of durable press for resin for a little plant. We were doing polyrayons and really slapping it on. It was the old formaldehyde, you know, uh, without the capping or etherification. We used a lot of it to get four plus DP ratings. And I won't admit what formaldehyde levels were on the fabrics or release. Uh, they did some monitoring in the plant and somehow we weren't breathing as much as we probably should have, but we had uh, what they call engineering controls to control them out in the air, but it's still a lot there. So we had had a corporate mandate and we moved to a methylated DMDHU resin and had a lot of success with that. And so um, I'll tell on my colleague Mike Lehman, he was working for the chemical company at the time, and that's where he and I first met. Now we're together on the STRC planning committee, so I've known him a long time, but we were running those trials in the plant together with, with the resin from his company. And we cut formaldehyde in half. One of the major brands out there was pushing formaldehyde down, and when they said it was coming down, all the other people started doing restricted substance lists, breaking it down. It was all voluntary. The government didn't tell us, but we knew that we needed to do it. So, at the same time, talking about low wet pickup technology and going back to vacuum, we actually bought a system from a company that worked. It didn't suck the fabric down in the vacuum and also had a way to filter out lint and re recycle the finish. So we saved 35% chemical cost. Also, we were seeing improved hand on the fabric because less surface finish with the vacuum and uh, with less shade change. We were able to not, uh, when we went to vacuum, we cut the wet pickup, but since the resin was staying in the fiber, we didn't have to bump up the concentration. So, from 85 to 2002, I'd worked with different companies and I'll just kind of jump around a little bit. But uh, I went uh, into our corporate offices at that second company I was at and we started looking at everything. Anything to do with durable press finishing, that was my job. Go in the lab, evaluate, find ways to do something in the lab that would replicate to production. And we did it. USDA had just issued their second patent on polycarboxylic acids, primarily BTCA, and it was using sodium hypophosphate as a catalyst, and it really worked well for whites. Um, we ran some plant trials with it. We ran a whole different blanket of shades, different fabrics, whatever, and it worked. We got good DPs out of the thing. I wrote a report, sent it up the ladder. When they saw the cost of the finish, it didn't go very far. 
At that time, we weren't motivated for zero from Alhide, so they wanted. They said nobody's going to buy our fabrics if we go that route. Uh, we saw a couple of shades, sulfur dyes particularly, didn't like the finish. Nowadays, sulfurs are still used on denims, but they're not as much on flat goods, so we probably couldn't have gotten around that part, but it just, it was sat there as a report in the file, and we moved on to other stuff. Also, one company I was working with early stuff on DMUG resins, or DMDHI as some people call it, and this is one of the other early non-formaldehyde technologies I got to work with. I did a lot of DMDHU optimization though. We were able to do some things both working in a textile company, but I worked for a chemical company where we were making DMDHU resins and I didn't formulate them, I didn't react them, but my lab applied a bunch of them and then we had an analytical lab test them for free from aldehyde. We ran through a hundred different resin formulations in a matter of weeks because one of our plants said, we're not going to buy your methylated resin anymore. We're having to report the methanol to the EPA that's going out to flu as, an, as hazardous, hazardous air pollutant or HAP. So we went to a different type of a therification system that was not uh, volatile. And it ran well. Actually, that ran, resin ran better than the original one as far as formaldehyde levels, performance, good balance of properties. So, going back to Cotton Incorporated though, started to pull it all together. So I mentioned Dr. Turner before, and uh, we've done some projects for formaldehyde reduction. I mentioned Tough Cotton technology. We had a twist on Tough Cotton, and uh, it was more for durable press than abrasion resistance, but it still was great for abrasion resistance, strength, what have you. And so I mentioned a couple of articles here that you can look up, but Tough Cotton, uh, it was uh, really a hit for us. We started looking at abrasion tests and were surprised at it. And so it was a new twist on durable press finishing because as I mentioned before, you put a wrinkle resistant finish on with DMDHU and you start looking at strength abrasion, it usually goes down to tubes. So this was where we called it balancing the property, still getting the good DPs, but balancing strength and abrasion. And so, um, we also did some work as a team, uh, Dr. Christy Browning, Jessica Desnoyer, who is Jessica Farrell now, married to Matt Farrell, who works with me, and Matt and I have talked a lot about DMDHU and also uh, going forward with non-formaldehyde resin optimization. So they somehow hooked up together after Jessica and I did this work uh, along with Christy. And we looked at practical methods to reduce formaldehyde put scavengers in the bath. They were available, they still are. After wash the goods. After washing, is that sustainable? You don't have formaldehyde going to the consumer, but what are you gonna do with the water? You know, it's gonna add energy to dry it after you wash this another time. But they were practical methods. We were able to get formaldehyde pretty much below detectable levels doing that. So if we needed a non-formaldehyde option, we could do it quickly with that. But some people would say, yeah, that's good. You're still being exposed to it in the factory if you're not careful. So is it a cheat or is it real? But it's there, it's, uh, we wrote it up. We actually presented it in, I think it's 2010 at the ATCC conference at that time. So going back to tough cotton and foaming, started to put together some of my expertise. So we foam applied tough cotton for durable press in conjunction with a dual action technology, repellent release, and we put the tough cotton on the back for the strength, but we this time we put the dual action on the face, trying to keep the stains from staining the face of the goods. We put a little bit in the back finish too, but putting tough cotton on the back where it would still control the wrinkling and other properties. So we ended up with a triple sustainability story at the time. Less energy for drying with foam versus padding. Less chemical using concentrating tough cotton on one side and increasing the wear life of the goods. What were, what were people talking about yesterday about recycling? So we were looking at maybe cutting the disposal 
thing is going to the landfill. Around the, just after that, foam eco care came along, and Jimmy Rowe and I had worked on this, but we also had the help of a chemical company, it was Clarion, now our chroma had the resin technology, and Gaston Systems had the CFS, so we did a lot of trial work, went, ran a trial overseas with this stuff actually to test it out. And uh, as opposed to moist cure, which uses a lot of acidity, time, floor space energy, we were able to pad dry cure and actually use a low temperature cure and it had very low formaldehyde too. And no need for after washing. So great sustainability story here. Here's a couple of formulas we ran. You can see we ran the ultra low formaldehyde DMDHU from Clarient and we uh, ran double in the foam formulations we did in the pad and everything was adjusted accordingly. And you can see the wet pickups down here at the bottom. It was 60% for pad, 30% for foam. So the drying time was cut by 25% or so. And then we cured them both the same way. They still need the amount, same amount of curing to, to set the resin, but we cut the drying time now. So we got good smoothness ratings. This was a cotton poplin. That's hard to get a four smoothness rating on, and it's a white. So three and a half, we were patting ourselves on the back. And then uh, tear strength, we saw just a hair better with pad, but still looking pretty good on the warp. But um, let's see, flex abrasion though, we were really thrilled about this with the foam. It was about double what we had pad, and I'll show you the pictures of that one. From out high, it was about the same, but look at these levels. Well under the 70 part per million, 75 part per million that a lot of people want to see on uh, wrinkle-free goods. These were the abrasion tests. We think with pad we were ending up with more surface finish and more degradation than we were with foam. Because we were foaming on both sides, we were splitting the foam up, so it wasn't like we were putting the foam on the back and abrading the face, but for whatever reason, we got improved performance there. So, several benefits that I mentioned, the curing versus traditional easy care less water, superior abrasion performance, and good smoothest ratings, and low formaldehyde. Comparing to traditional non-iron moist cure finishes had an even better story because of the less acidity, less washing, what have you. Tough cotton for nits. About three plus years ago, and uh, several of us got cotton were involved in this, we took the original tough cotton that Dr. Turner developed for abrasion, which was mainly for, for bottom weights or wovens, and moved it on to knitted fabrics. But we had a challenge. We didn't have a good way to test it. If you put on a flex abrader, it would stretch. Not a good way to, you know, for a knit, not a good idea. With a Martindale, if you did the standard wool abrasive, it'd just sit there and rub forever and you never could see anything. So. There was, uh, it was a proposed hosiery method, but I'll give a, my colleague Angela Massengill, and then Jimmy Rowe was working with us and they got their heads together, so I get some credit for this, but I'll give credit for where credit is due here. As a team, but particularly with their assistance, they tr started putting Trizac as the abrasive on the Martindale abrasion pad, and I'll show you a picture of that. And the Trizac would eat through the goods, but believe it or not, with tough cotton, it, it was well above what an untreated piece of cotton would do. Even after 20 laundering cycles, we could wa wash it and then abrade it and see uh, resistant. Trizac, they're round pads, you put them on a little thing and that's what you uh, sand your car with, like a little rotary abrader. So it stands up to sandpaper is what we're saying. So, up here is standard wool abrasive, and these are Trizac, and here's a little close-up of the Trizac. And conveniently, the pads were cut about the same size as our Martindale, so we just pull the Velcro and slap it down on the wool pad, and it stays there. So it's been a real hit for us. We've had, we had a major brand back about three years ago adopt this technology, and now all the other brands are starting to follow. They love it. It's economical, easy to apply, and it works. 
Here's some tests on this that we did. Uh, control, and by the way, it controls untreated, but we have put like a standard softener on this control versus Tough Cotton, which has a softening component. Uh, at zero wash with the um, unfinished, you see this. If you had a, a regular softener finish, it would resist abrasion at zero, but what happens at 20? A lot of these silicone softener formulations and all will wash out. Tough Cotton will stay there. And so if you look at these numbers, I mean, you're talking orders of magnitude higher than the control, even at 20 laundries. We've done it on multiple knit substrates. It works on Logan's too, as mentioned before. Gonna move on to the latest greatest at Cotton Incorporated. I'm proud to say that we just heard that the patent number has been issued for pure press technology. So we're really excited about that cotton and we've done a lot of work on this. I've spent a lot of time traveling overseas. I'm kind of grateful the coronavirus wasn't hitting then or I might not have been able to get all this trial work done along with my colleagues overseas that ran this. So, so we had a team. I was the project manager, but everybody worked on it real hard. A lot of people in this room from Cotton can take credit for this. We use practical available chemis chemicals. Uh, it's a non truly non for my high durable press technology. And some other non for my high things that were available would give you fair performance. Some of them didn't work as well. I mentioned BTCA, but we had cost and potential shade change, other issues. The catalyst for BTCA. Uh, the DEA has on their hit list is maybe, some, I think you can use it to make an illegal drug with it, so they monitor it. So with Pure Press, we don't have any of that stuff. We've got easy, uh, you know, easy to obtain chemistry, low yellowing, low shade change, low potential for odors when it's run correctly, and great durable press ratings. And I will say, if you're moist curing a piece of cotton, you can maybe get those extremely high ratings, but if you're pad dry curing with DMDHU and then you're pad dry curing with moist cure, we're getting equal or better ratings to the standard resin technology. And then we're getting great strength and abrasion uh, resistance. That was actually uh, a, a big surprise for all of us. So I've covered some of this already. The other thing was pure press cures at low cure conditions. So you don't have to cook it as much as DMDHU to get it to react. We started with some trials in 2017, but we ran lab trials in our dye and finishing lab and some of the guys back there working the lab were with me at the time and we ran those, they ran well. Uh, but then we went to a factory and uh, Ed Turner and I were together on some of those, and then uh, later on shirting, some of the rest of us, Nathan Miller, Mike Shin was with us, Mary Ankeny, and Mary's one of the co-inventors on the patent with me, along with another guy who's moved on from cotton to do great things. So we got good success. We ran pre-cure and post-cure on bottom weights. Post-cure, we got good crease durability. That surprised us. We didn't think that chemistry would hold a crease. The other things we were seeing are higher tensile tear, great flex abrasion. We don't understand it still. And it's, it's, it lasts, I mean, I, we'll look at it at three liners, but we've gone to 20 liners. The durable press ratings hold up and so does the flex. So, this is just an example to Martindale, and this was laundered. It doesn't say the slide, but it was laundered and then tested to show you the, how well Pure Press is working on the Martindale test. This is using standard wool abrasive, not the Trizac. Because we, uh, this, on Wobans, we had to stick with the wool abrasive. But we look at flex abrasion too, it works quite well. We moved on to cotton shirt and fabrics, and hey, you've had more success. Really good DPs on certain substrates. We were able to run less constructed or lighter weight materials that you wouldn't run with DMDHU. Some mills said, well, I'm not gonna run the DMDHU as a control, it might pop out on my tenor frame while I'm curing it. With pure press, it didn't happen. Large improvements of flex. 
Here's just an example of a cotton poplin. It was a yarn dye shirting. We got 4.2 DP ratings out on a one to five scale. And even 20 liners were above three. They bounce around, so we're not sure about the 3-3 three, three, cause this one bounced to a 3-2 with a control, but then it bounced back up again. It's a visual system. But look at some of the strength. We're still puzzling over that tinsel and the warp cause the, the filling didn't follow that, but needless to say, pure press is better. Tear strength wise, really looking good in the filling direction, which is usually a weaker direction. And then the flex abrasion, and this is the three launderings. From out of hide, we should have said less than 16 because really it's less than detectability. This is noise in the from out of hide determination test. So, pure press is versatile. We've applied it to a wide variety of fabrics. I will just say briefly, without going into details, we're moving into knitwear now, maybe for, for a higher end uh, act to wear a golf apparel. We're thinking about where you want a nice neat look as a golfer with the comfort of cotton. Truly not from out high and all the strength and abrasion we've been touting. So maybe we'll look at going forward. Maybe look at well, wet pickup finish with pure press technology with the CFS and now spray applicators are coming along. There's people with new innovative spray systems. And then new applications with tough cotton for abrasion resistance. We're actually doing some underground work on that, applying the tough cotton for abrasion with yarn treatment and also with the metered addition on certain things. And then Dr. Farrell and I are always looking for the next generation of non formaldehyde resins. Uh, several of the other co-workers uh, here are always on the search for us. Give you some parting thoughts because I'm running out of time. But Preston Alders said this is STRC last year and I paraphrase him. If you're miserable in your job, and we we're talking to the younger audience yesterday afternoon, but or if you, you know, you, you, you're not assigned something you, you really wanted to do, you take it with enthusiasm and you own it. And you, you might start liking it, kind of my, like the early part of my career and looping back, I got good at this stuff. And then when I came to Cotton Incorporated, I was able to pull all the pieces together. But I did a grunt job as a frontline supervisor for a while in the mill. I worked third shift and I bore it. And then they started seeing my technical talents. And so uh, you, might, you might like it. If you don't, maybe you ought to think about something else, but at least put your heart into it. And then looking at the back of my career, I'm grateful for the things I've learned well, and it's no matter how trivial, and it is cyclic. You've seen these things keep coming and going. And one of the things that Terry mentioned, I get compliments on it, and I'm not going to be shy about saying it. Don't hold on to things. Don't think you're looking more important because you have the knowledge and your coworker doesn't. Share it. Because I'm not afraid of mentoring somebody and seeing them surpass me. That means I was doing a great job as a manager. But also, it makes our whole company good. It'll make your company look good or your university. But don't be greedy and hold on to it. You're not doing anybody any good. And Jim Valvano said this two weeks before he passed away, but don't ever give up, don't ever give in. Fight the hard fight. And it means a lot to me, and I've had a couple of life changing experiences, both career-wise and personally, where these words mean a lot to me. I want to thank everybody, but also my wife, Anne Marie, who's here. And ATCC, everybody in this room, but everybody worldwide. We'll talk about that a little more when I get my medal at lunch. Cotton Incorporated for support. Dr. Turner, who I mentioned. Dr. Charlie Tomasino, who's the one who taught me about passing on knowledge. He would come back to me if I asked a question. If he didn't know, he'd research and bring it back to me. And again, all of you for being here. Thank you so much.